Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our latest webinar regarding the recent developments of transfer pricing in New Zealand and Australia. We have the pleasure to announce that the webinar is going to be conduct conducted by TPA's new network partners, Mark Loveday and Harnash Singh from TPTS, which stands for Transfer Pricing and Tax Solutions. PTS is a specialized in transfer price international tax and corporate tax in New Zealand and Australia. Today, Mark and Arnash will be sharing an overview of each country's transfer pricing regimes, highlighting the similarities, differences, documentation requirements, and tax authorities' approaches in both countries. In case you have any questions, please feel free to ask them via the chat function. And uh, without any further ado, Mark and Arnash, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victor. And welcome to our webinar today, looking at the New Zealand and Australia transfer pricing regimes. We're gonna start off today with a high level overview of the transfer pricing regimes for these two countries and, and how they compare. We're gonna to touch on the documentation requirements and then some of the areas that the tax authorities are focusing on. Of course, no discussion is complete without some comment about BEPS 2.0 being uh, pillars one and two and their application in New Zealand and Australia. We've specifically included a discussion around inbound loans and New Zealand in particular has legislated some particular transfer pricing rules for inbound loans. And in Australia, it's been an area of dispute. We're gonna talk about the APA programs in the countries, which are similar yet have some quite practical differences. And we're gonna round off with a brief mention of some of the Australian transfer pricing cases. So please feel free to ask questions as we go. We may reserve some of them to the end, which we've, we've left some time in the presentation for, for questions. So just first of all, a bit of a comparison of the Australian and New Zealand transfer pricing regimes. Australia operates a self-assessment tax regime and it was, it was actually ahead of the OECD BEPS actions eight to 10. Around 2012, the Australian tax office or the ATO was, was concerned that a, a couple of cases under the existing transfer pricing laws had shown that the the laws weren't working as the ATO had intended. So they substantially changed the transfer pricing legislation in 2012, 2013. And some of the key changes that, that occurred were to ensure that the economic substance was going to be paramount in, in terms of pricing. The ATO had the ability to recharacterize transactions when the form was not aligned to the actual conduct of the parties. The OECD guidelines were specifically referenced into law, and now that references obviously to the 2017 version of the OECD guidelines. And the transfer pricing law now references arm's length conditions and not simply arm's length pricing. The ATO has a long history of releasing quite detailed rulings, guidance notes, and more recently, practical compliance guides or PCGs as they call them, to help the taxpayers understand the ATO position and help the taxpayers evaluate the transfer pricing risk. And one of these PCGs deals with seven safe harbors that the, the or simplification measures that Australia offers. And they include safe harbors for small taxpayers, some small distributors, uh, some of the service fees and material transactions, and small value loans. There are some mandatory filing requirements around transfer pricing in Australia, particularly for large groups. And we're going to cover off the documentation aspects later in the presentation. I would note though that all companies that have aggregate transactions, related party transactions over $2 million have to file an annual quite detailed international dealing schedule as part of their tax return. 
and there's and those and, and that schedule contains quite a lot of detail about their intercompany transactions. Uh, finally on this I just note that neither Australia nor New Zealand have adopted the authorised OECD approach for um, dealing with branches. They both treat a branch as if it's a separate entity but neither country allows notional transactions intra-entity. A couple of other measures that Australia brought in following the BEPS reforms, one was um, diverted profits tax and this applies to larger groups over that 750 million euro or 1, 1 billion Australian dollar threshold and the aim of the DPT is to dissuade Australian companies from diverting profits offshore like through marketing hubs set, set up maybe in Singapore or Hong Kong or migrating intangibles out of Australia and paying royalties into lower tax countries. Under the diverted profits tax, the principal purpose has to be to gain a tax benefit. And there are some important carve outs. So it doesn't apply if the income in question is under $25 million or if the offshore tax involved is at least 80% of the Australian tax and Australian tax, corporate tax rates 30% and another the third carve out is if the commercial benefits of the structure outweigh the tax benefits that are, that are, that are, that are obtained and the sanction if the diverted profits tax applies is a 40% tax rate and that, can, that is obviously more than the 30% Australian tax rate. Now the second measure that uh, Australia brought in was the multilateral, uh, sorry, multinational anti-avoidance law or the MAL as it's called and this again was for the large groups over 750 million euro. It was put in place to catch those foreign companies that are effectively selling their goods directly to consumers in Australia but yet the foreign company doesn't have a permanent establishment and then there's a related Australian company that is in some way connected to those sales or able to facilitate making those sales like creating demand for the sales. To be under that MAL there has to be a principal purpose to gain a tax benefit and if, the, um, if a company falls within the boundaries of that MAL then a PE can be deemed to exist for the foreign company and the foreign tax benefit and the tax benefits they get can be effectively cancelled and penalties up to 100% can be charged as well. I'll just turn to the New Zealand transfer pricing regime and uh, the pictures there, one is the, uh, the successful New Zealand rowing eights at the Olympics, won the gold medal and the other picture is uh, very proudly the New Zealand Team Emirates that defended the America's Cup once again. In 2018 and uh, post the, um, the release of the, the BEPS actions, New Zealand made some important changes to its transfer pricing legislation and, and kind of notable changes were to align the transfer pricing rules to the OECD guidelines and particularly to align them better with the Australian transfer pricing rules. The onus was placed on the taxpayer on transfer pricing matters. Previously the onus was actually on the tax authority for transfer pricing matters. The statute bar period on transfer pricing matters was extended from the usual four years for other tax matters to seven years and there were some very special rules put in for inbound loans which we're going to talk about a little later. Now these changes were effective only from the 2019 years onwards. Unlike Australia there are no annual disclosure requirements around transfer pricing. Instead the um, inland revenue or we call it the IRD, 
rely on a series of questionnaires which they send out to uh, specific taxpayers to collect information. And they tend to be sent out mainly to larger taxpayers as a risk assessment tool. So there's a transfer pricing, specific transfer pricing questionnaire which asks taxpayers around the details of their related party transactions, uh, what methods they've used, whether they have documentation, uh, whether there are any transactions with low, low tax jurisdiction countries, whether there's any transactions with no consideration, those sort of questions. There's other questionnaires as well which um, Inland Revenue send out, so there may be one on intangibles and royalties. There's been uh, questionnaires specifically for financing and international tax matters. The Inland Revenue has a useful website that summarises a whole lot of the transfer pricing issues, but it doesn't have the detail that the ATO provide through their various rulings and uh, practical compliance guides. And the other thing is that the commentary on that website can actually change without notice being given. Now I mentioned in Australia there's seven safe harbours, in New Zealand there's three. Uh, one is for small distributors, another one relates to um, small value loans, and we'll mention that a bit later, and the third one relates to um, low value adding services, which is um, the, the OECD uh, low value adding services where there's a 5% markup. Like Australia's MAL that I mentioned, New Zealand introduced a similar law where large foreign companies, this is once again the 750 million euro threshold, where the foreign companies are selling goods into New Zealand uh, directly but don't have a permanent establishment. <clears throat> but they may have a New Zealand entity that is helping facilitate those sales. And in those situations, a permanent establishment can be deemed to exist for the foreign company. But it has to be more than merely incidental purpose of avoiding tax. So it's not just every situation that that arises that you're going to, um, that this PE avoidance law will be invoked. There has to be more than merely incidental purpose to avoid tax behind the structure. And as a result of bringing this law in and uh, effective from 2019 onwards, quite a few of the foreign companies that were operating through direct selling, uh, they switched to buy sell models, um, selling through a New Zealand, a New Zealand subsidiary um, under a limited risk kind of model. Okay, I'm going to turn over to Ranish, who's going to talk now about documentation requirements. Thank you, Mark. Um, hi, hi everybody. Um, in terms of the transfer pricing documentation requirements for New Zealand and Australia, perhaps um, let's just focus on what's on the slide. Both countries are very similar. They have uh, a similar love for sports. Um, in this case, uh, rugby um, is, is very prominent in both countries, except only one country of late wins. Um, I'll let you pick which that one is. Uh, in terms of the documentation requirements for uh, New Zealand and Australia, uh, both countries do not have a mandatory requirement uh, for taxpayers to prepare documentation. However, uh, contemporaneous documentation is definitely required to mitigate shortfall penalties uh, in case an audit uh, comes up with one. Australia, as uh, noted earlier in Mark's presentation, has definitely got more disclosure requirements in the uh, the first one, I suppose, is through the international dealing schedule uh, for companies that have got $2 million um, and more uh, international dealings. And that is as part of uh, the, the Australian company's uh, tax returns that need to be filed. And within that international disclosure schedule, taxpayers actually have to disclose whether they have got transfer pricing documentation or not. So in a backdoor way, the ATO does get to know whether a taxpayer has got documentation in place or not. Both uh, New Zealand and Australia have got extensive uh, information gathering powers. 
Uh, and as a result of some of the work associated with PAPS, um, they can now request information from offshore, tech, uh, offshore parties of uh, the local companies. The OECD guidelines and the three-tiered uh, approach to documentation for significant global entities have been adopted by both countries. And that is really the foundation for transfer pricing documentation uh, for, uh, for both Australia and New Zealand. Uh, they, they have bought into the OECD guidelines, and in, in fact, both have imported the OECD guidelines into their domestic legislation uh, and expect taxpayers to prepare transfer pricing documentation in accordance with that. Um, it is fair to say that Australia has got additional guidance on um, the, uh, on the uh, doc transfer pricing documentation aspect with uh, a five uh, set of questions process, which more or less aligns to the the nine-step uh, OECD approach. What is unique, I suppose, to Australia is they have their own concept of what is um, uh, called a called a local file. Um, and, and the local file is essentially an XML file generated in accordance with ATO developed XML scheme. The file is lodged annually by significant global entities operating in Australia. And it actually requires quite extensive information, including um, information like uh, legal agreements associated with uh, related party transactions. So that is quite unique. So they have their own concept for local file. Um, that is not to say that the transfer pricing documentation is not uh, required once the local file is prepared. They have a transfer pricing documentation that needs to be prepared in accordance with what they called 815B or 815C documentation. 815B refers to subsidiaries um, and it's consistent with the reference in the Income Tax Assessment Act. And the 815C documentation is for uh, branches operating in Australia. So uh, a little bit of subtlety with respect to Australia. In terms of comparables, um, uh, New Zealand is a fairly small market. Uh, however, they still prefer uh, that uh, taxpayers uh, consider whether there are comparables in New Zealand. So an expectation of some benchmarking is required in New Zealand for New Zealand comparables. And if if one is not found in the, the IRD does defer to uh, the Australian market for comparables. So the, the, so the closest market they consider that is suitable for New Zealand companies is Australia. And um, again, if there is failure to find that, then uh, companies can go further afield like North, uh, North America, Europe, et cetera. Uh, Australia is very strict on uh, uh, local comparables, so they do expect taxpayers to uh, to do a benchmarking in Australia. And again, if uh, the benchmarking is not found, then they do defer to um, North America, Europe, etc. So um, that is, um, you know, a, a very strong theme that is coming across um, from both authorities, um, making sure that the comparables that are selected are comparable, and they are actually within the market. Uh, conditions that the local entity is operating within. Now, turning over to the next slide, where we, where we look at some of the focus areas um, uh, for both the tax authorities. So, um, Mark, if, uh, if we could uh, turn over to the next slide, please. You, Mark. So the focus areas um, from a New Zealand perspective, I suppose, um, and um, not very different from Australia, both of the tax authorities have similar focus areas. Um, so in New Zealand, there has been quite a lot of work that the IRD has done on inbound distributors. There have been extensive amount of investigations that have been done in recent years, mainly on uh, technology companies. Um, uh, and um, companies that um, have got a sophisticated structure, for example, not reporting sales, et cetera, uh, yet operate as inbound distributors. So the IRD has got some fair idea around what sort of um, uh, returns they should be expecting as a result of that. Um, there has been similarly a lot of work that's been done in Australia, and Australia has gone as far as to create some profit flags uh, in respect of some of the uh, distributors. So um, four broad areas that have been indicated over there. 
um, on the slide, general distributors with medium risk, um, the, uh, the ATO expects uh, it in to be well, within 2.1% to 5.3% return on sales. Uh, life sciences, uh, uh, which, which has low, lowest level of medium risk uh, is 3.6% to 5.1%. And ICTs, uh, so 3.5% onwards, I suppose, and then automotives, um, 2% uh, to 4.3%. So um, Australia is um, perhaps uh, through their uh, practical compliance guides have been a little bit more, um, um, I guess, guiding to taxpayers as to what they expect. And um, they, they do um, sort of, I guess, highlight uh, flags between which uh, taxpayers should be, um, I guess, swimming within in terms of their profits. So um, if you are outside those flags, um, especially on the outside the bottom tier, then you, you definitely uh, will probably get a knock uh, on the door by the ATO. A lot of work on, in either country has been done around inbound financing um, and uh, a lot of, um, uh, lot of um, disputes have arisen uh, in New Zealand, particularly around uh, inbound financing that we have been involved in. And similarly in Australia, things um, have gone to court even uh, in terms of in, inbound financing. I will let Mark cover that because, um, for example, in New Zealand, there has been some bespoke uh, transfer pricing legislation done on how debt should be priced on inbound loans. Um, and similarly, in Australia, uh, there have been some remarkable uh, findings out of cases, um, and it sort of does guide where the, uh, the ATO's thoughts are. Um, some of the other transactions that have come under scrutiny in recent times is obviously uh, New Zealand companies making market support payments um, and loss-making companies. So both, both those areas are something that the, uh, the IRD has done some activity in, and um, um, you know that is the same in, in Australia. Perhaps one thing um, it needs to be really looked at from, a, uh, from both a New Zealand and Australian perspective, but perhaps a lot of work that's been done in Australia is marketing hubs. So um, the ATO really does not like a lot of uh, companies uh, that uh, use marketing hubs in low-tech countries like Singapore and um, uh, con countries like uh, Hong Kong. And there's a lot of work that they have done around substance and in fact, uh, it's really um, uh, doing the functions assets and risks associated with um, the marketing hub uh, in those low-tech countries. So that has come under some serious scrutiny uh, by those tech authorities. Um, intangibles is obviously another area um, which um, which both authorities are looking at quite actively. And if you're making a royalty payment, they definitely do expect you to make um, profits, uh, reliable profits in, in both Australia and New Zealand. Now, um, so those are probably some of the focus areas and where the, the IRD and ATO have concentrated their um, their disputes process over the last 10 years. Now let's turn to something that is probably the flavor of the year. Um, um, and uh, we'll just move on to the next slide, which is around um, the pillar one and pillar two. So we'll probably um, take Australia as the first one, uh, which is on the next slide, um, being the larger market. There is probably going to be a lot more um, implications for Australia. Um, as a result of pillar one and pillar two. Now, Australia did not opt for uh, a digital services tax and um, really did not go it alone um, like it did with some of the other um, work that it did in respect of its legislation to um, curb uh, what, what was best they felt in their market. So they worked quite extensively with the OECD in respect of um, in, in respect of pillar one uh, and pillar two. Uh, what is quite significant, I suppose, for Australian companies um, is that um, the extractive and financial sectors, uh, which form a significant part of the Australian economy is excluded. So um, a lot of companies that are in that over uh, Euro $20 billion mark um, and have um, residual profits, they are in that extractive and financial sector. And the exclusion of that does help Australia quite significantly. Now, although it is very early days, um, Australia has not made any formal announcements on the potential tax impact for Australia. And 
Um, however, as you may know, uh, Dane Needle, uh, a London-based attorney from uh, Clifford Chance, has estimated a net benefit of um, US $431 million uh, for Australia based on uh, oil consumption data for Pillar 1. So um, uh, if that um, goes the way um, of the estimation, then uh, Australia is set to gain. Uh, there is no doubt that Australia will gain. Uh, it's just the extent to which it does is probably the question. Um, the ATO has um, got some very elaborate views on profit margins, as we discussed in the previous slide. Um, so what is going to be interesting to see is to what extent uh, that uh, those profit margins align with uh, amount B. Um, uh, it is probably fair to say that some of the margins that the uh, ATO has been chasing in the uh, APA program or through the profit flags that they've announced in the uh, compliance guides have been quite high. So um, uh, amount B might put that to be. Now turning to perhaps uh, the other significant part of BEPS 2.0 is Pillar 2. Now Pillar 2, I suppose, in terms of Australia, Australia has got a fairly robust tax system and um, um, its corporate income tax rate um, is 30%. And accordingly, it's not generally a, a, a low, low tax jurisdiction for M&Es to park uh, profits there. So it's probably not going to be falling foul of the minimum um, tax rate um, per se, I suppose. However, there are some some uh, interesting uh, things to kind of um, uh, to look at for Australia. One of them um, is noted as timing differences. Now, it is an anticipated um, that in Australia there may be companies that may have timing differences with respect to profitability. Um, as an example. Um, mining ventures uh, can have a period of loss for quite some time before they start deriving a profit. So, um, you know, there is a risk that in later years when they derive a profit, um, their effective tax rate may be lower than 15%, primarily because most of their profits are effectively uh, sheltered by the losses that they've incurred previously. So it is not known how Pillar 2 will address this, but this is definitely going to be a practical constraint, I suppose, for Australia to, to resolve um, prior to finalization of BEPS 2.0. Now, one other thing before I um, probably just move on to the New Zealand slide over there. Um, for Australia, um, in terms of um, Australian headquartered companies, um, um, this, the, Australia does have uh, some very comprehensive CFC rules, um, although there are carve-outs um, in respect of that um, uh, in terms of active income. Um, so if uh, an Australian headquarter company has got a subsidiary offshore, which is operating in a low tax country, uh, the active income is normally excluded for tax purposes and it's not brought to tax in Australia. It would be interesting to see um, the role that Pillar 2 plays on that because that carve out may well come back to Australia um, and get text under Pillar 2 um, in, the, car, in the, um, the concession that is made under the CFC rules in Australia may, may no longer be a concession. But I guess, again, there's a lot of water to flow under the bridge uh, with respect to that. So um, that sort of covers probably Australia and uh, BEPS 2.0, fair to say, a lot of work still needs to go there. Now we turn to New Zealand. New Zealand, similar, I think, you know, in terms of uh, where they um, where they sit. Except there are some nuances with the with the, the New Zealand tax landscape. Um, I suppose it's a very uh, it's it's a far smaller market. We don't really have uh, such a big uh, uh, re the the extractive sector or financial services sector. So um, some of the um, some of the uh, matters that are um, uh, particular to those will not really impact New Zealand. But um, what is perhaps um, clear is that um, New Zealand also has taken the approach not to go it alone. It has um, uh, really cooperated through the BEPS uh, 2.0 program. Uh, it has not introduced DSD and it's certainly off the table now. Um, the, the, the estimated 
revenue very early on, the uh, New Zealand government had predicted was that they were going to gain $60 million uh, as a result of um, uh, the BEPS 2.0 program or or what rather I think was more around digital services takes when you uh, when they were sort of right early on in, in the piece. However, uh, that seems to have changed with uh, what has come uh, through uh, under um, the latest um, Pillar 1 um, announcements. Um, again, Dan Needle has suggested that that uh, amount uh, would be around US 112 million based on world consumption data. I think the jury is still out on that as to um, whether that will be the extent to which New Zealand will gain, but certainly New Zealand will be a net beneficiary of, um, of Pillar 1 reform. Interesting to say, uh, no New Zealand parent is large enough uh, to, to have a revenue threshold of um, Euro, uh, Euro to $20 million, uh, and even the largest company in New Zealand, Frontera, is actually uh, not even half of that. So. No New Zealand parented company would come under Pillar 1 at this stage. Uh, we probably need some tech giants to, to become New Zealand parented companies um, to, to fall under that. It is fair to say that some foreign companies, uh, example Google, um, will pay more tax in New Zealand um, than they currently are. Um, and it is probably that's how um, you know, New Zealand expects to gain. In terms of Pillar 2, um, I suppose, um, similar to Australia, we have got a very, um, um, not a low tax rate, we've got a 28% uh, tax rate. So the, the minimum taxation rate of 15% is not going to be a problem. Uh, normally companies don't park profits in New Zealand because it's not um, favorable to do so. Um, but what is perhaps, uh, uh, unique to New Zealand is we don't have a capital gains tax in um, if there are large uh, capital gain stakes uh, for a uh, for a large company um, in New Zealand, a significant global entity in New Zealand, um, and the effective tax rate in New Zealand is below 15%, that could definitely be picked up through the Pillar 2 initiative. So it would be interesting to see how that goes um, through the program, through the back door, maybe it may be text. Um, and the other thing is that uh, whilst New Zealand has got uh, for New Zealand outbound some um, some um, regimes such as um, similar to in Australia, uh, the CFC regime to make sure that companies are not uh, parking profits in uh, low tax countries, there are carve outs in terms of not uh, taxing active income. So again, um, it would be quite interesting to see how Pillar 2 affects that and whether that uh, indirectly brings that uh, in for taxation uh, when in fact the CFC regime deliberately uh, excludes that. So it's something uh, that probably one needs to um, sort of watch for in the final analysis. Now on that note, I will uh, pass on to Mark uh, to discuss um, some of the very important developments in the inbound loan space. Yeah, thanks Ranish. Uh, the picture on the uh, slide is uh, the Prime Ministers of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, and Australia, Scott Morrison. Um, President Biden referred to Scott Morrison as the fella down under, and, and they are not kissing in this picture, but they are doing a traditional Maori hongi uh, when they met recently. So just looking at New Zealand and uh, the special rules that were brought in. Now, prior to uh, BEPS Action 4, which is deductibility of interest, New Zealand already had pretty robust in capitalisation rules. And following um, the BEPS Action 4, those rules were further tightened. And now the safe harbour for ThinCap in New Zealand is that you are allowed interest bearing debt up to 60% of a denominator which is total assets less non-debt liabilities. And in response to BEPS action for New Zealand rejected a further restriction which the OECD had put forward which was based on an interest cover um, uh, type measurement and 
but instead they they went with a very specific set of rules and, and fairly unique. And these rules require the interest rate pricing for high risk borrowers to be close to the cost of senior debt borrowing at the parent level. So what they wanted to make sure was that um, the the interest rates on any inbound debt would would be fairly close to the parent's cost of borrowing. And this was called the restrictive transfer pricing rule and it applied on only inbound loans over an aggregate of $10 million. So I mentioned that it applies only in high risk circumstances and the two situations which are high risk one is where the thin capitalization debt percentage is over 40%. So I mentioned before that the safe harbor is 60%, <clears throat> but in this case, for this rule, the a high risk is if the thin cap is 40%. And the other situation of high risk is where the lender is in a jurisdiction where the tax rate is 15% or lower. Now the way that the restriction works is to limit the credit rating that can be used for the determining the um, arm's length pricing of interest rate for the New Zealand borrower. And the credit rating that the New Zealand company, that you have to use for the New Zealand company is the rating of the group member that has the most senior external debt, less one or two notches. So if we take an example, say on a standalone basis, uh, New Zealand would have a, the New Zealand borrower would have a double B rating, but the wider group has an A rating, then we have to price the debt two notches below that group A rating which means pricing it at a triple B plus rating. Now that's actually four notches above what we would have previously priced that debt at being the standalone New Zealand rating. And not only that, the rules also say that you cannot price into the interest rate various attributes of the loan such as uh, that the loan may be subordinated to other external debt and it can't be priced with a term longer than five years. So various attributes of the, of the loan, which would have give, given rise to a higher interest rate, cannot be used. They have to be modified or ignored. IRD has a safe harbour for small value loans, and that, so those are loans under 10 million in aggregate. And what they what the, the safe harbour rate that's allowed is a base rate plus 3.75% margin. So it's quite a, a generous margin that's allowed um, as a safe harbour for small value loans. And just turning to Australian inbound loans. So Australia also has very robust thin capitalisation rules. In 2017, the ATO put out a practical compliance guide uh, where it gives its guidance as to risk assessment when you're pricing inbound loans into Australia. As a general rule, the risk increases where the, disc, where the debt cost to the Australian borrower is higher than the parent's cost of borrowing. It provides a detailed risk assessment matrix with scoring of various debt attributes and also the circumstances surrounding the borrowing. So by way of illustration, uh, let's say the Australian company borrows at 3.16%, which is happens to be 62 basis points above the parent's cost of, of debt. But it borrows from a Hong Kong related lender on an unsecured and unsubordinated basis. Now the ATO would rate that as moderate risk and it's mainly because the lender is based in Hong Kong which only has a 16.5% um, corporate tax rate. And, it, and, and, and the guidance says to be low risk, the, the price on the Australian debt 
the interest rate would have to be within 50 basis points of the parent's cost of debt. The ATO also have a safe harbour for low value loans, but the, the measurement there is loans under 50 million and they have to be denominated in Australian dollars. Now currently the small value uh, loan interest rate there is 1.79%. So it's a fairly low rate and especially low, I suppose, when you compare it with the fairly generous rate that is allowed in New Zealand on small value loans. I mentioned 3.75% for the margin that's allowed in New Zealand. Now, I wanted to finally just talk about the landmark Chevron case in Australia where the appeal decision got handed down in 2017. Now, in that case, the court implied a parental guarantee into the loan arrangement and therefore the outcome was that the taxpayer hadn't proved its case that the interest rate was not excessive. The facts in the case were not particularly helpful for the taxpayer and just to give a summary of the facts, the Australian company which uh, Chevron Australia was involved in a large gas project and to fund that they had issued commercial paper into the US market through a US subsidiary. Um, that paper was issued at 1.2% coupon and the um, the, uh, the, the, the the paper had a parental guarantee given by the US parent of Chevron. Then the, the, that US subsidiary lent the money to its Australian parent um, in Australian dollars at around 9%. That loan had no security, it had the terms had no covenants or no guarantee from the parent. So the external loan that was issued to the public by the US subsidiary had a, a parental guarantee, but the internal loan did not have any guarantee or security. <clears throat> and the rate, there, was, there wasn't a lot of debate. The rate was consistent with a standalone kind of credit profile of the Australian company. Now, the court considered that no lender would have made that loan without seeking various security, having loan covenants in an agreement, and certainly any lender would have sought a parental guarantee. So the arm's length conditions required a guarantee and the, and the court implied one into the agreement, which meant that the interest rate would have been a lot lower with a guarantee, and hence the taxpayer lost the case. Now, I'll turn to Ranish will carry on. He's going to talk about APAs. Thank you, Mark. Now let's look at the APA programs in both countries. Both New Zealand and Australia have mature advanced pricing agreement programs. New Zealand's is fairly streamlined um, and has a less complex uh, APA program. In New Zealand, you can gain a unilateral uh, within six months. The IRD has got a very strict timeline around um, turnaround and looks to do things very efficiently. Um, it is fair to say that they do go through the process. Transfer pricing documentation is expected. They will do their own functional analysis interview and also uh, appropriate benchmarking. On the other hand, in Australia, the process can be quite uh, time consuming. A unilateral can take up to 29 months and a bilateral, on the other hand, can take three years or more. The process in Australia is complicated by a bespoke triage program. And the triage program looks at basically collateral tax issues that may be associated with an APA. So the ATO takes a very fine tooth comb when an APA application is made to make sure that there are no other open issues that the taxpayer may have or any collateral issues are covered as part of the APA. Fairly expensive when you're going through the triage program in Australia for the APA. Uh, whereas in New Zealand, given the streamlined approach, the APA program can be quite straightforward and can be quite uh, efficient for taxpayers to do. Fair to say that in both countries, the unilateral APA program has uh, come uh, a further way back 
uh, given that nowadays you have to uh, disclose to the counterparty country once you enter into a unilateral APA. So there has been taxpayers' uh, apprehension in relation to entering only unilateral APAs, and they have normally deferred to doing bilaterals, which obviously has taken a lot longer in both countries. Now let's take a look at some tax cases. And uh, if you look at the slide over there, we say Australian tax cases. Fair to say that New Zealand hasn't had any uh, transfer pricing cases in the last uh, decade or so. That's not to say that uh, there are no disputes, transfer pricing disputes in New Zealand. Of course there are. However, the approach in New Zealand is uh, fairly uh, different. The IRD takes a uh, dim view at going to court and has a very detailed uh, program relating to disputes. And the disputes process is really um, undertaken so that the parties reach a compromise before any court action is necessary. Uh, that is not to say that uh, ta the taxpayers in New Zealand and the, co uh, and the um, IRD have been at loggerheads and uh, some uh, transfer pricing cases have taken almost three years to resolve, uh, even though the disputes uh, process is meant to resolve them earlier. Now, on that note, let's uh, look at some of the Australian cases which have been of some prominence in recent years. Now, cases in Australia, probably the last 10, dec uh, 10 years, has been quite uh, important and has played a significant role in the reform of the Australian transfer pricing legislation. And it all started uh, way back uh, with the Roche case. Roche was a fairly low-level court case and involved the import and resale of ethical drugs by Roche in New Zealand. The ATO uh, took exception to the performance of Roche um, and examined the transfer prices uh, that Roche had adopted on the import uh, of drugs from associated parties. The ATO presented a TNMM approach and found the profits of Roche not in line with the benchmarks. There was quite a sophisticated approach in terms of uh, reviewing the the margins Roche had in relation to the various divisions under which the drugs were imported. And uh, in most cases, the ATO found that the profits Roche was returning was lower than the benchmark profit. Roche, on the other hand, had adopted the cup method to basically support the transfer prices it had adopted on the import resale of drugs. And the cups really supported the the uh, prices Roche had uh, paid to its international related parties. So basically the ATO presenting the TNMM method and we have the taxpayer presenting the CUP method, the court came and supported the taxpayer and found that the CUP approach was more proper, effectively raising the bar for using the TNMM method. The the court also caused a little bit of controversy by including in their obiter comment on whether Article 9 of the Swiss-Australian DTA could be used to reassess transfer pricing in Australia. So that did uh, cause a lot of uh, commotion uh, and gave inspiration to the ATO to use that route to see if they could assert the use of TNMM approach through a double tax agreement. Now that uh, particular um, approach was used in the next case that we're going to discuss, which is the SNF case. In the SNF case, um, again, the taxpayer had sustained losses on uh, the import resale of uh, goods. And uh, the taxpayer had imported uh, goods from its related parties offshore. And in fact, the the circumstances were such that since um, in inception in 1990 to 2004, the taxpayer had uh, uh, incurred recurring losses. The ATO um, took exception to it, basically took the approach whereby uh, they adopted the TNMM method and found that the profits that the taxpayer had uh, made was not arm's length. On the other hand, SNF mounted a strong case um, 
adopting cups, basically demonstrating that uh, through the use of the cup method, they were not paying a price that was higher um, than those, um, in those demonstrated by the cup method. There was a lot of uh, argument uh, between the councils relating to comparability um, of, the, uh, of the cups. The court was actually took a very uh, reasonable approach with respect to um, the cups. And despite there being some comparability differences in terms of functional comparability differences, the court actually accepted uh, the, the cups that were adopted by the taxpayer. The case uh, is, is known for basically um, making clear that the OECD guidelines was not relevant to determining the Australian TP law at the time. And also that the loss making history of a particular taxpayer was not relevant in de determining the arms then price. Now, both those comments are very, very important because what the ATO then did was essentially change the legislation. So they changed the legislation retroactively uh, in Australia so that the OECD guidelines was actually brought into the domestic transfer pricing law. And in fact, retroactively uh, for uh, with countries that had a DTA with Australia. Now that brings us to probably the, the last case that we want to discuss, last but uh, perhaps the most recent, um, and it is the Glencore case. The Glencore case has got an interesting set of facts. Uh, it involved a, a Australian copper mine operator, Cobar Management Pty Limited, that sold 100% of the mined copper to its Swiss-related marketing hub company, Glencore. Now, prior to 2007, the parties had uh, set the price for the copper based on a formula. The formula was 50% based on specific regional benchmarks and 50% on spot market prices. Now, what had happened uh, around 2007, there was significant volatility in the spot market prices and the parties agreed to change the transfer pricing formula going forward so that both parties were more certain about the outcomes and they would not be bearing undue risk. Now, obviously, the new formula meant that the copper prices was set against a benchmark that would be more com that would still be commercial and what the parties did was they set the price with a 23 percent discount to the copper reference price on the london metal exchange the new formula overall resulted in lower but consistent pricing and de-risked the of the pricing arrangement for the parties now given it resulted in lower pricing overall the ato argued that the pre-existing formula was more arm's length from an Australian perspective. The court uh, ruled against the ATO and concluded that the new pricing formula was arm's length. In doing so, it concluded that there, were, there may be a range of arm's length outcomes, each of which should be accepted as arm's length. According to the court, a practical and sensible approach was needed, and the taxpayer did not have to show that they achieved the highest transfer price, but an arm's length one. So quite a commercial approach uh, that was taken by the court in this case, and it was very praiseworthy of uh, the taxpayer and uh, its related party taking effectively what would be a sensible approach under the circumstances. So a very remarkable case in that if one were to go and argue um, against the taxpayer on the basis they did not seek the highest price, but a price within the range or which would be otherwise, be, uh, otherwise arm's length, that would still be accepted by the court. Now that uh, concludes uh, the presentation on the tax cases.